when Dave uh, gave us the analogy from uh, uh, the story of Gideon, he, he wasn't exactly exaggerating. So, um, you know, there's we only have a few people here, but you know, the important thing is that we're here to worship God, to serve Him. And of course, everybody's welcome. Of course, if you're watching online, you know this is a subtle, subtle prod that if you if you're somebody who's very involved with this here, that you know this is this is this is here for everybody. But you know we're thankful to have whoever we can get here. Yeah. So you know, Dave already introduced a couple of the. Uh, the concepts we're going to be looking at. There's themes that, that stretch through all of Daniel that are very important. But instead of, I'm going to make things a little bit more personal too, though. You know, this story, it's, I don't know, it always kind of touches me in a deep way. It, you know, more than just a uh, an analysis of the way things seem to be on a wider scale. This, this story makes me look at my own heart because I, well, I guess, I guess you'll find out soon if you're not familiar with it. But before we get started, let's pray. Father, I thank you for blessing all of us. I thank you that, that you have come to save us, Jesus, that you you paved a path in the word that we're to walk on. And that you, when you pursue us, that you'll take great lengths to make sure that we know you the way that you are. So Lord, just take me out of the way right now and let your spirit fill me so that everyone who's present and watching online will be able to to hear your word today in a, in a deep and meaningful way that goes beyond just knowing the words or understanding the concepts. Instead, write these words in our hearts so that we can continue to serve you in faithfulness. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, we're going to be looking at the story of Nebuchadnezzar, you know, the a great king of Babylon. He he was somebody who had it all. He had wealth, power. You know, he'd conquered many lands, probably the greatest empire, you know, in the in the Middle East at the time. And he had a bit of a big head, you know, as we learned in our previous uh sermons in the series that you know he built uh, built statues in his honor and had a very inflated view of himself but the way that he meets God in the story we're going to read is it, it makes I don't know it really changes the way that we think about God because by all rights Nebuchadnezzar should have been one of God's public enemies. You know, this is a guy who ransacked the Holy Land, who did committed all kinds of atrocities that we see in history. You know, this guy, he wasn't a good guy. He should have been called one of God's enemies. But, you know, as, as we'll see soon, that he defies our expectations. You know, he, you know, when God works, he often works in ways that, you know, run very counter to the way we think things should work. And when he works, the way that we judge others is shifted dramatically. So let's uh, start by reading from Daniel chapter 4. And I'm going to start in verse 1. So... King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. 
How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is the eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was home in my palace, contented and prosperous. I had a dream that had made, that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded all the wise men of Babylon to be brought before me to interpret the dream before me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence and I told him the dream. He is called Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, and the spirit of the holy gods is on him. So I'm going to pause for a second. Note that this is uh, Nebuchadnezzar speaking. Continuing on. I said, Belteshazzar, that's Daniel, chief of the magicians, I know that the story of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream, and interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew so large and so strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. He said in a loud voice, Cut down the tree and trim of its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. But let the stump and its roots, bound with iron and bronze, remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched in the dew of heaven, and let him live with the wild animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man, and let him be given the mind of an animal, till seven, till seven times, or days, pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict, so that the Most High living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on the earth and gives them anyone he wishes and sets them over the lowliest of people. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Belteshazzar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men of my kingdom can interpret it for me. But you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. So, our story begins with a vision that God sends to Nebuchadnezzar. So in it we see this mighty tree that seems to represent that prosperity that he had. That, you know, he was a, a man without peers, somebody at the top of the world, you know, you know, a spectacle to behold. But then we see the tree cut down and we see it uh, stripped and, and it was bound up and, and, and then placed back into the ground. So there's a couple questions there. And as we'll keep reading, Daniel will interpret these things. But, you know, these are, these are quite incredible pictures. You know, they show, they can, they can often represent, you know, the hopes that we might have of becoming a great person. Or the type of life we would want to have. But then this is also, you know, then, then you have a picture of all of these things falling apart too. You know, there's this mighty spectacle of the tree being chopped down. And we'll explore that a little bit later. But the verses that we're going to focus on, you know, you know, obviously we have the, the verses talking about the, the rain falling and that, that uh, the Nebuchadnezzar will have the mind of an animal for seven years. But in verse 17, this is, this is kind of the main, the main thing I want to hone in on. So it says, 
The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict, so the living may know that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets them over the lowliest of people. So this verse is a big clue to, you know, why God is sending Nebuchadnezzar this vision. You know, he is somebody who is above everyone on earth at, at the moment, at least from his perspective. And it's clear that God is telling him that he's not really the one in charge. And he, it's kind of like a warning. He's saying, really, you know, I, the Most High God, you know, rule over every kingdom and rule over even Nebuchadnezzar because he calls, even sets over the lowliest of people. So he's clearly indicating Nebuchadnezzar here. So, you know, what, what does that mean for us? Well, it means that everybody who's in charge has been placed there by God and is accountable to God. And God, you know, and, you know as this story continues, we'll see how God you know, works in Nebuchadnezzar to, to create a change. So Daniel interprets the dream. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, My Lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which is large and strong, and its top set touching the sky, visible to the whole earth, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing food from all, giving shelter to the wild animals, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds. Your Majesty, you are that tree. You have become great and strong, and your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky, and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven, and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze. In the grass of the field where its roots remain, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let, the, let him live with the wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, Your Majesty, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my Lord the King. You will be driven away from the people and live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms of the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree in its roost means that your kingdom will be restored when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, please be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right, and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that your prosperity will continue. So there we have it. Interpretation of the dream. That Nebuchadnezzar is faced with a choice. He can choose to acknowledge that God is the Most High, or he can continue to live in the ground, to live as a, a beast, to lose his mind. Now, this is a pretty dramatic situation, but this is something that many people, in fact all people go through, that we go through times in our lives when we, we completely lose control of ourselves, where we're given over to evil, over to where we have, it seems like we have a lot, but things are dramatically taken from us. You know, and as we continue, we'll see how that, that plays out as well. But in any case, we still have this tension too between the rule of heaven and rulers. We have... There's a hierarchy that exists in the world. And if you look around, even the evil 
the nations that continue to sin, they are still accountable to God. And eventually they will have to give account to him for all the decisions that they make. You know, some, and some are more obedient than others, but ultimately God will not be defied in a very ultimate sense. So continuing on. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on his roof in the palace of Babylon, he said, Is it not the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power for the glory of my majesty? That's not a, you know, a proud statement at all. <laughs> that sounds like a, a dangerous words. Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from the people and live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times, or seven years, will pass for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all nations on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from the people and ate the grass like an ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew out like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. So, God called him out on his bluff. You know, he said, I'm the biggest, I'm the biggest guy on the block. And God said, Nope. <laughs> so this is a warning. Anyone who decides to think that, you know, they're hot stuff, just watch out because God is on the side of those who are humble. But people who think too highly of themselves, the, the, well, the word says that he opposes the, the proud. So if, you build, if you're building yourself up and trying to make yourself stand above others, just know that You'll never stand above God. And if you, if, if you know him, he's going to make sure that you, you're aware of that. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? At the same time, my sanity was restored. My honor and splendor returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. So this is, ne this is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. My advisors and nobles sought me out. And I was restored to my throne and became greater than ever before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. <laughs> so there you go. You know, it took seven years for Nebuchadnezzar to crawl around like an animal, but his pride kept him from confessing that that's all he needed to do was turn his eyes to heaven and say, I'm not the biggest guy in the block. God is king. That's all it took, but he was a pretty stubborn guy. And, you know, I think that we all see a little bit of ourselves in Nebuchadnezzar, right? Like he, that pride that wants to, you know, you want to feel important. You want to feel like you're above things. But when you meet God, you realize that you know that something else is you know something else is cooking. So I'm just going to quickly flip back. We're going to we're going to backtrack a little bit to the beginning of this passage. And notice remember that tree that was in his vision. So in verse 11 it says, the tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, 
and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read that again. And the birds lived in its branches. So just take note of that. From it, every creature was fed. So, believe it or not, there's actually a parable that we find in the New Testament, in Matthew, that Jesus uses to refer to the story of Nebuchadnezzar. So, I'm going to quickly turn to Matthew 13, verse 32. So, this is Jesus speaking. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet it grows, and it is the largest of garden plants, it becomes a tree, so that all the birds will come and perch in its branches. Now, that's an interesting detail. Mentioning the bird, you know, mentioning a massive tree that birds will come to perch in. And it's pretty clear that that detail seems to be referring to the story of Nebuchadnezzar. And the reason it refers to the story of Nebuchadnezzar is the, is the story of Nebuchadnezzar is a story of restoration. It's a story of a man who is humbled that sees the error of his ways and comes to learn that God is king. Now, when Jesus identifies that the kingdom of heaven is like this, what he means is, is that, that that seed is like a proud man being humbled or dying. It's a common, you know, the planting of a seed. You know, Jesus frequently talks about seeds, you know, dying to produce something greater. And of course, this is seen in Jesus' death and resurrection. But I believe that this is connected to the story of Nebuchadnezzar because in order to become a part of the kingdom, we also need to undergo the same revelation of Nebuchadnezzar. That... That we will be grow, that will be grown into mighty trees that are prosperous, that the birds can nest in. When we accept the authority and rule of Jesus in our lives, when we when we look to Him and say, "I cannot save myself. I I cannot be in control of my own life." You know, I might as well be a beast that's crawling around in the fields for all the good it's doing me. Admitting, you know, I'm lost, but setting our eyes on Christ and accepting his rule and authority in our lives is really what this, what, what the story of Nebuchadnezzar has for us. Because it teaches us that in order to become, to enter the kingdom, that we have to die to ourselves, that we have to give up our old proud self, you know, the self that wants to rule the world, and instead submit to the rule of Jesus to become a part of his kingdom. Amen. So, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to add this, but I think I will. You know, this is a personal story, so I'll, I'll, go, I'll go into some details, but not everything. You know, I, I went through the same thing. I, you know, I was going to Bible school, and I, and I was pretty successful there, but it, it was really starting to get to my head just how well I was doing. And I became really impressed with my own accomplishments. And not that that was necessarily a bad thing all the time, but it did become a pride issue in my own life. And this, in any case, God, 
you know, he allowed me to succumb to a certain mental illness that basically, you know, made me like a beast for, thankfully it wasn't seven years, but it was, it was still two months where I had no control over myself. And I had to, I had to be in a psych ward for a solid month. And coming out of it, you know, I didn't, I was restless until, you know, I turned my eyes back to heaven and, and acknowledged that Jesus was going to run my life and no one else was going to do it. So I, I really do connect with this story, and I know that many of you do too, that we need to stop taking ourselves so seriously <laughs> and just let him be in charge. And we'll be a part of that magnificent tree that spreads over everything because really our kingdoms, you know, on a, our own lives, our governments, everything is inconsequential compared to the kingdom that Jesus is bringing in. So I'd like to invite you today that if you haven't turned your eyes towards heaven and admitted that you are powerless to run your life and accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'd encourage you to, to do that right now and to tell somebody about it. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you that you are a God who humbles us, but also a God who restores us. Lord, I pray that, that you would just cause all the things that keep us from you to die away. That if, we're, if we feel self-important or we built up ourselves, that you would cut us down a notch but bring us into something better. Thank you for being someone who pursues us, Lord, like you pursued Nebuchadnezzar, a man who did not deserve it, but you did it anyways. We thank you for this, Lord Jesus. Amen.